Good evening. It is extremely hot in this country. Somebody needs to really just tone it down. Okay, um, jumping straight into it. So I've had a new idea about the whole kind of coding stream thing. Like, I've been watching some coding streams from other people. I've been watching some of the, like, more popular coding streamers. And beyond like the the streamer talking to the audience there really isn't a vast amount of interaction like with with video games you, like what, you, what you're getting nowadays with stuff like the darwin project and a bunch of other games is you can link up your twitch account and there's ways for the audience to actually interact and influence what's going on oh what's up for here and i think that's nice i think it's nice for the audience to be able to get involved and i was kind of trying to so I was on a stag do this weekend, and if you're in the US and not sure what a stag do is, it's when, um, before a wedding, there's like a big party thrown for the groom. Uh, so I'm a little bit worse for wear, but I was thinking kind of on the train there and back, how would an audience interact with a coding stream? Like, what are the ways to do that? Um, Twitch codes Java. Uh, yeah, that actually crossed my mind. Do a Twitch, like Twitch plays Discord bot or something like that. But something that would be quite nice, I think, one thing that sucks is that while I'm coding, you're looking at this one file, and you, you if you're interested in what's going on in the other files, you really don't have that information. And you also, it, like, if you want to tell me, like, say I made a mistake, but I haven't noticed, but you have noticed, it's really hard to say, like, go to this other file, I can't remember what it was called, the text up here is too small, but there's a bug on some line somewhere I couldn't find. Like, it would be nice if it was easier to say, like, this line here, there is a problem, you should look at it. So I was thinking of doing, like, some near real-time way for the audience to see all of the code and to be able to, like, comment online, like in a code review, like, comment online to the code in a way that I see it. Uh, and say like, yeah, this sucks, you could do this better, or there's a bug here and you should look into it, or anything like that, right? I think that would be it would be a nice thing for the audience to, be able to go to like, I don't know, live.samhu.co.uk and it would show you the code that I'm currently working on in near real time. I'm not talking about like keystroke real time, but like every time a file is saved, like you, I wouldn't have to commit to GitHub, you just see it. So I, th I thought it'd be interesting to kind of start thinking about how that would work. Like I had a bit of a look uh, for existing solutions for this kind of thing, but they're they're all not quite what I'm looking for. Like they're all just a little bit off. And I just started thinking to myself, I don't need huge levels of sophistication with this. It's just messages back and forth. Like there's not a lot to it. So I thought I'd play with some of the APIs that I have available to me. So I've kind of, I've started off a blank project here. This is just a totally blank Maven project. Um, so the first thing I want to look at is Java has a, new Java file, please. Can I have Java? Can I not do like uk.co.sync and that's a module? There we go. Okay. Much, okay. It hadn't synced or something like that. That was scary. So Java has a watch service API in the new java.nio libraries. So public static void main string args. Um, is the font size and stuff okay? And can you hear me okay? I haven't streamed in a while. So I don't know, things could have screwed up. I, I'm also doing 60 FPS, you may have noticed, because it really doesn't make huge amounts of difference. Like, encoding time and stuff like that, like not much of the screen changes from frame to frame, so it's minimal. And I haven't had to up my bitrate or anything like that. So I thought, why not? So watch service. So how do I get hold of one? Uh, I'm just going to have to quickly Google this. There is an editor that does something like that, the Atom service. Can you link that to me? 
because it would be nice to not have to actually do anything to get this functionality. I thought it'd be cool to play with the APIs anyway. Teletype. What that? Collaborative in real time. Uh, is this quite what I want? Uh, I will look into that more off stream. How are you doing, Huntex? How's things? You too, Fajita. How's life? How's your weekends and stuff? Yeah, I'm also pretty good. I'm dying a little bit in this warm weather, but other than that, I'm good. Uh, all collaborators can edit together in real time. Yeah, I kind of... Like, it's not that I don't trust you all. I just... That's not quite what I'm looking for. Uh, watch the... Okay, let's just copy and paste code from the internet. Because this is 2018, and that's what people do. Ah, no. No, 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 no. I heard back from my branding guy as well, and he said he's going to have some initial designs with me at some point this week. Psyched about that. Uh, Fia says, I'm good, sent some resumes out, playing around with CockroachDB. What the fuck is that? Oh, right, yeah. I I wish by default, it, no, I can't remember what the incantations are. By default, Maven is like Java 5 or some crap like that. Maven, Java 8. And I never remember quite how to do it. Okay. Uh, this one seems legit. Nope, not legit. Uh, okay, right. Fine, whatever. I'm cool with that. At some point I need to try Java 10 as well. I know that at least a few of you have said that would be a good idea. Uh, yeah, Maven defaults Java 5. What's up with that? Like, why? This is 2018, goddammit. Uh, just a replicated SQL in Go, the SQL database for global cloud services. All right, okay. That's kind of sufficiently vague. I don't really. I still don't fully know what that means. Does it give like read after write guarantees and stuff like that? Okay, so we have our watch service. Um, Register one or more objects with the watch service. Any object influence watchable can be registered. The path class influences the watchable interface. So each directory to be monitored is registered as a ugh, as a path object. As with any watchable, the path class influences two register methods. Entry create. Entry delete. That events may have been lost or discarded. Yeah. Okay, that's kind of nice. Uh, okay. Oh, uh, okay. That seems quite nice. So let's just copy that over. Uh, let's just monitor the current directory. Sounds like my PC is getting upset about encoding. Parallel GC in Java 10 is really nice. Uh, how has the GC changed in Java 10 as opposed to like, is it still the G1 GC? Uh, the idea is it's distributed in fault tolerant. It's called Cockroach DB because it could theoretically survive an atomic bomb. That is a tall claim. Import all of the things. Got one line. Alright, so now we have the watch key. Processing events. Get the watch key. Three methods provided. Return the queued key. Available. Um, return the queued key. If no key is available, method waits. Process pending events with the key. You fetch the list of watch events from the poll events method. 
Retrieve the type of event by using the kind method. No matter what events the key is registered for, it's possible to really receive an overflow event. You can choose to handle the overflow or ignore it, but you should test for it. Retrieve the file name associated with the event. The file name is stored as the context of the event, so the context method is used to retrieve it. Fair enough. After the events of the key have been processed, you need to put the key back into a ready state by invoking reset. If this method returns false, the key is no longer valid and the loop can exit. This step is very important. If you fail to invoke reset, the key will not receive any further events. Okay. <clears throat> well, you know what comes next. <laughs> That's just got me all of it. Because why not? Alright, well, let's just see what we're doing here. Quick catch up on chat. Uh, G1GC is parallel now with multiple threads instead of a single thread mark and sweep, so full GCs are faster. Okay. I thought. Uh, okay, um, Alright. I was about to say that I thought G1GC was parallel already, but it's concurrent, isn't it? It's not parallel. G1 was concurrent, so full GCs. Okay. Full GCs in G1 are quite rare, no? Or at least they should be quite rare. Uh, up my thingy thingy there. And we can ditch this. For a variety of reasons, I prefer Wild Tree over the Wild True over the four variant. I don't like that we have an unchecked cast here. That's kind of it's kind of not fun. Why do we have to do that? If okay, whatever. Annoying, but whatever. Right, don't care about this. Don't care about this. Everything else seems pretty cool. Uh, I'm gonna write that differently. Not my favorite way of expressing that logic. Um, the goal is that they never happen, but this is nice for the worst cases. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. I actually gave a talk recently about the G1 GC in work and how it differed from CMS and all that malarkey. Uh, I think it's pretty sick, actually. Like, when you... Uh, it, okay, so, show of hands, is anyone interested in me just ranting about G1 GC for a while? Not ranting, but talking about it. Because, um... I didn't... Like, the, the, obviously... So I, I know enough to talk about it with people, but I don't know, like, a super detailed view of things. Uh, Fia says, I'm interested even though I have no clue what it is. That's okay. Uh, so, do I have paint that I can lean on here? Yeah, I do. Good. So, in the beginning... What, what have I got here, color-wise? Black. Okay, cool. So, in the beginning... Not in the beginning, but prior to G1GC, we had a garbage collector called the Concurrent Mark and Sweep Garbage Collector. Uh, and the idea was that Java has this region of memory called the heap, and the heap is divided into a bunch of spaces. Um, actually, hold on a second. Uh, GC Tangent. Have you seen this new stream marker feature? Like, I can add markers to my streams now, so I can like mark what's happening at what point. Like, I just put a GC marker in there say that we're talking about GCs at this point. I'll try and like add markers and things like that. I think it... Uh, uh, oh, you can also add them via chat using slash marker. Someone give that a try. So, the, the heap is split into a bunch of different parts. So we have Eden, or the new generation. Uh, I have been dramatically optimistic with where I put that line. Uh, forward slash, not backslash. Unexpected error. Good. So, 
we have I have my I have not planned this diagram well at all. Let's put that there. Arrays. Is it gonna like really upset people if I miss part of this line? When I'm trying to erase it. Uh, go away. It's like a test of my mouse accuracy. Go. Okay, there we are. So. The, the heap is split into a bunch of different spaces, so we have new gen, which we'll, we'll say is in this, and this is where objects, like, when you create a new object, it goes into the new generation, like, so that's how it starts life. Um, so the, the new gen itself is split into two spaces, so you have the actual Eden section of it, which we'll say is this bit. And then you have two what are called survivor spaces, which we'll put over here. So the idea is you create an object and it goes straight into Eden, uh, into new gen. And when new gen gets full up, uh, it will trigger a new gen GC where the new gen generation is scanned. And if any of the objects in there are dead, I'm skipping over a lot of detail here, but if any of the objects in there are dead, like nothing holds a reference to them anymore they get removed. And the way they get removed is when the new gen when all the alive objects in new gen have been found, they get copied into one of the two survivor spaces. So there are always two survivor spaces and there is always at least one of them that's completely empty and I'll talk about why in a second. So the object is copied from new gen into survivor and then the whole of new gen is marked as empty. So anything that's left in there and not been copied over to survivor is then gone. And new gen GCs, as a result, are really quick. And it's it's like, you can think of it as completely free if you lose an object in new gen. Like, if you create an object and it dies before, like, it doesn't get copied over into survivor space, the, the cost of that object is, is essentially nothing because it's so simple to allocate and deallocate them. It's literally a few cycles each. Um, so once an object is in survivor space, when, when the currently in use survivor space, because only one of these halves is ever in use. Um, when one of the halves fills up, you then do a GC of the survivor space, and you, do, you follow the same process as you did with new gen, but you copy into the other survivor space. So you're always kind of flip-flopping between survivor spaces and discarding any objects that didn't survive. And every time an object survives a GC, there is like a counter on it that's increased. Uh, this is called, what, tenure? Like the, the like the tenuring of the object, so if it survived eight GCs, for example, it'll have a tenure of eight. And once it reaches a certain threshold, and I cannot remember what the default is, but the value that I would typically see in production back when I was at Google was fifteen. So, if an object survives fifteen GCs, then or if or if survivor space is just full and you you can't allocate any more objects into there, you'll like tenure things early. <clears throat> And what will happen is then it'll it'll get leaked into the old gen, which I'm going to mark as blue. So now we have old gen, which is this whole space here. Old gen. And the old generation is uh, GC'd far less frequently. So the when when so a lot of this is configurable when oh 15 is a default. Okay, thank you. Um, so when because old gen is so much bigger, it takes a lot longer to fill up, ideally. Um, but when it does kind of get full and nothing can be allocated in here anymore, you trigger what's called a full GC. And a full GC will scan the, the entirety of old gen and it will get rid of objects that don't have any references to them anymore. Uh, and one of the big problems with CMS that kind of isn't really surmountable is... Well, it kind of is, but it, when you when you deallocate or you, you, you collect objects in old gen, there's no actual like compaction done. One of the neat things about new gen and survivor space is because you're copying into new spaces all the time, all of the alive objects are contiguous and they take up like, there's no fragmentation, there's no empty spaces in between of them. And it's really nice to have that, but old gen, over time, it will fragment. So if you have like one kilobyte allocated then 500 bytes allocated, another kilobyte allocated. If you deallocate this 500 byte in the middle, 
then you'll need to find something else that is 500 bytes or smaller to fit back in that slot if it's in old gen because n nothing is ever moved in old gen. There's no compaction phase, which is uh, a real big limitation of it and one of the metrics that when you're running like Java jobs in production, you want to keep an eye on your heap fragmentation because heap fragmentation can cause real problems. If you've got like a super fragmented heap, like you can have a bunch of memory that is available, but all the objects you're trying to store are too big and you'll end up getting like, I can't remember what it's called, It's probably, I think it's allocation failure or something like that and you'll keep triggering GCs and it won't free up enough like large blocks of space and it becomes really awful. So this is concurrent mark and sweep. Uh, I've skipped over a bunch of detail but in essence this is, this is what it is. So G1 GC is a lot of the concepts are transferable. So you still have the concept of a an Eden, a new space, a survivor space, you still have the concept of old gen, but the way that it divvies up the heap is a lot different. So let's take the heap again. And this time we're going to divide it into a grid of equally sized blocks of memory. And I don't recall what it is by default, but I want to say that it's two megabytes or something like that. So all these blocks, let's say, are two megabytes. Uh, this is not something you can configure. I think what happens is um, the JVM looks at the heap space you've given it and it it divides the heap into 2,000 equal size chunks or there like or near enough something like that. And the idea is that it dynamically will decide how much new gen survivor space and old space you need based on the usage like the behavior of GC in your process. So if you have a ton of short-lived objects, it will allocate a large portion of the heap to be new gen because new gen, like, let's say you have a, you, let's say you, you're writing an HTTP server and you're writing a web application where the majority of your objects will live for the duration of a request. And if your requests are taking on average, say 150 milliseconds, then all of the objects you create inside of 150 milliseconds will be dead like after the request has ended. So you need enough heap to store a request's worth of objects multiplied by how many requests you get, if that makes sense. Like if you're getting uh, 150 makes the mathematical mathematics of this complex, but like let's say you're receiving a lot of requests and after 150 milliseconds all the objects die because that's the average length of time the requests live then you need to have a new gen that is large enough to hold all of the like ongoing requests until they've died because if you promote anything into old gen while the requests are still in process when that request is then finished let's say a couple of milliseconds later the object has kind of already made it into old gen and collecting old gen is much slower. Although it's not necessarily that much slower in G1 GC because of the way that G1 works and I'll go into that now in some more detail. Although does that make sense? That was a bit rambly. I'm just like, I'm trying to explain that the longer an object lives, typically the, the, lo like the more time it takes to collect it because um, there's this thing called the, the weak generational hypothesis and the idea is that objects either die very quickly or they live forever so like if you analyze the behavior of almost all programs you'll see this pattern and it's like objects are very short-lived or they're they're around literally forever and the use case where this is not true is in-memory caching don't get me started on in-memory caching in java you'll make me angry but the idea is that especially in like web-based applications most objects die very quickly and you want to you want to have them die in new gen because new gen is cheap to collect. So let's say we've got a few. Let's uh, say this is a new gen block and it's full by about this much. We've got another new gen block over here and it's full by that much. Then we've got another one over here and it's full by that much. Uh, let's make a couple of old gen blocks. Let's say this old gen block here is quite full. And there's another one over here which is quite full. Then let's say we have a relatively full survivor block over here. So at some point, G1 will get triggered, and it's I think it's very similar criteria to CMS. It's like when its new gen blocks appear to be quite full, um, 
let's fill these up. So we've allocated a whole bunch of objects, like a few requests have come in from a web server. And it's like, oh, we've run out of new gen, we'll trigger a new gen collection. So it goes through all the blocks that are currently allocated as new gen. And concurrently, it will check which of these objects are still alive. And it will then prioritize, like, like actually properly garbage collecting blocks that are mostly dead, which is why it's called G1. G1 stands for garbage first. So it will always try and prioritize the most garbage filled blocks that it can. So let's say it finds the majority of this one is dead here. You can see my cursor, yeah, good. Um, the majority of this one is still alive and a bit of that one is still alive. It will know to collect this and then it will know to collect some of this and it will it'll essentially try and collect as much as it can to fill another block. Uh, and once it's done that, let's say, uh, I need like a proper eraser, like a larger one. It's kind of annoying. So it collects all the stuff in here. It collects all the stuff in here. And it knows that most of this one here is still alive, but it takes all the alive stuff that it found in those two, and let's say it puts it into this block here. Uh, actually, I've done that wrong. These would be survivors. And then those two are marked as free. So the reason that it breaks the heap down into much smaller chunks is because rather than having, like CMS has a whole bunch of flags you can tweak to tune the behavior of the garbage collection to try and get it low latency or whatever you need to be, like you might have requirements on latency or you might have requirements on throughput, I don't know, like depends on what you want from your application, but web, web application is difficult and low at pause times in the GC. G1 kind of throws out all of the flags that CMS required you to try and fiddle with and it was like, okay, all I need from you as a user is one piece of information. And the one piece of information it asks for is, what is the maximum pause that you are able to tolerate in your application? I think by default, it sets it to, oh, I want to say it's like 400 milliseconds or something like that. And because each of these blocks are a fixed size, and because it keeps track of how long it takes to collect each of the blocks, it can heuristically, like it's, it's very, very statistically likely that it will never pause for longer than you ask. And this is an extremely attractive property for a garbage collector to have for people building web apps. <coughs> now I can't remember how we were talking about G1, but that is basically what I know about it. That's like the high level overview. Um, and then I will say here, end of GC chatter. How. And we'll go back to playing with file system APIs. But yeah, that's... There are parts of that that are concurrent, parts of it that it, they stop the application, then um, parts of... According to Huntex, like, apparently the collection is becoming parallelized as well as concurrent, which is really pretty cool. Um, this type of GC is called something specific, can't remember the name of it now. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't know. I, it's, this is the first GC of this kind that I've encountered before. Uh, the Go GC is very different, for example. Okay, so... Get the watch key. Watcher. Uh, oh, I need to... Re uh, that's, what I was, that's why I was doing that. I need to actually register. I think I just deleted something important. Yeah, I did. So I do still need this. I think. Uh, Huntex saying, I implemented something similar for a uni project, was fun. I bet. You implemented a GC? That sounds awesome. Um, order events. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So why do I need to do that? The following code is about register a path, path instance for all three types. What's this down here doing then? Here's an example of an event processing loop taken for the email example, which watches the directory waiting for new files to appear. Uh, methods specific to the watch surface API. Wait for key to be signaled. Okay, so why do I take a key? Like, why do I need this? Do I need this and this? Like, do, do I need to do this registration here? 
Register the file located by its path. Watch service. Identification. Oh, is that just Hmm. Suppose we wish to watch uh, directory. Okay. But then what did this do? Retrieves and removes next watch key. Waiting if not yet present. Okay, well I guess I could always just system dot out dot print line. Um <clears throat> so first things first I will try and print the event that I will say file name get no, uh, absolute. Nope. Yeah, I'll just leave it like that. Uh, what else can I get from this? Can I say kind? I can say kind. Uh, for here, I will just say ev. Okay, so it's not obvious when it gets printed out what it is. And I believe I can now run this. And it should just hang. Yeah. Um, and I should, in theory, if I do, no, I save the file. What if I make a new file? Um, test. No. Okay. Uh, I suspect I've done something wrong. Let me. Actually, I should I should debug. I just want to see what each of these things does in turn. Alrighty, so step over, step over. Okay. Then I guess to there. All right, kind of as expected. Uh, I don't want to catch most of this stuff. I just want to let it propagate so that I know when something has gone wrong. Uh, same with this. Just propagate. Oh, um, oh yeah. Uh, so I don't really understand fully this API, to be honest with you. Like, it doesn't test this key in any way. I need to just check. The following cursor which shows how to register a path instance for all three event types. As with any watchable, the path class implements two register methods. This page uses the two argument version pre-argument version takes a modifier which is not common. Okay. Uh, the watch deer example. Okay, let's have a look what they've got in here. Uh, can you read that text okay? Is it big enough? <coughs> it seems okay. Um, register... Okay. Where is the main? There it is. Okay, so what does it do? New watch directory was a, okay, then process events. So, first thing it does, registers all the directories. and registered them. How does it know that they're all directories? These could be files, couldn't they? Oh yeah, pre-visit directory. Alright, fine. You got me. Okay, so it seems like my code currently only looks for changes in 
the current directory, like it doesn't do anything recursive, so if I do something in a subdirectory, then it's not going to show me anything. Which is fair enough. Looks like I'm probably going to have to copy, copy this as, at least as a starting point. So what I can try and do to verify that is just to make something... Oh, whoops. Uh, sure. Why, where did it put, it put key into a map, right? What, what is a map for? Oh. Why does it do that? Why does it not just get the watch key? Huh? I don't fully understand why it has this map of keys. Strong tie dice says hello. Hey, welcome. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm currently kind of like puzzling over a new API that I'm not familiar with, so uh, I apologize if I miss any chat messages or anything like that. Uh, Samo, oh hey Sam, you you almost managed to sneak a stream from me. I keep trying. Keep trying. Uh, yeah, so I don't really fully understand why it puts the watch key in a map. Uh, so I, I'm currently. So what I'm trying to do currently is just figure out how the uh, Java .nio dot uh, like the, the watch service API works. Like you can watch a directory for changes, which is something that I haven't done before. Um, not uh, an API that I'm familiar with. Asin is now following you on Twitch. I apologize that I missed that. Uh, I mustn't have audio on. There we go. I should hear it next time. Sorry about that. Thank you very much for the follow. I I appreciate that as always. I have a lot of fun kind of streaming my code and my confusion to you all. Uh, I can only hope that you gain something from it. Uh, yeah, so it puts the watch key in there, then it gets it out. I don't really fully understand that because you can get the path from the key, right? That's what it, yeah, that's what it does down here. So what I'm gonna do is, just gonna put that there, then, uh, what are you complaining about now? That should compile, in theory? Yeah, so I think now if I put something in the main directory, test.txt, yeah, okay, so now we've had file, yeah, it's, it's actually created. Why do they use four uh, semicolon silicon like old C programs? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I changed it to while true, because obviously that's my jam. Alright, so... We do have to do that kind of recursive watch. Which is fair enough, whatever. Um... So files dot walk file tree. Uh, crib from what they have in here. Just gonna go ahead and copy this. Uh, so I get dir and atters. Strong tie dye says, do you have any tips for someone who is learning Java? I'm learning it in uni, but I'm having trouble coming up with projects that I could do on my own to help further my knowledge. Um, so uh, just out of interest, is this, uh, is this, like, how did you find this stream? Did you scroll through Twitch at random looking for programming streams, or did you come from somewhere else? Or uh, The reason I ask is... Quickly typing something. Uh, yeah, the reason I ask is me and a bunch of the people that kind of watch this stream regularly all kind of hang out together on a programming Discord server, where we kind of like help people learn things about programming, and we 
there's a whole like sub community of people that do coding live streams. There's a bunch of channels like language specific stuff and a question they actually, we actually get quite frequently from people trying to trying to start out is that they're not sure where to start. Like they do maybe a bunch of tutorials, maybe they go through Code Academy or something like that, but then like they find a hard they have a hard time applying that. Like, what do I do? And we have this like pre-compiled set of resources and there's a bunch of there's a whole bunch of project idea lists on the web um, oh Sam I beat me too that's what I was typing out yeah so that invite link goes to our discord server and if you want to like go there and ask if you ask that question there a bunch of people will give you links to like programming project idea lists and stuff like that and hopefully you'll get some inspiration from that on like what you can do next uh, yeah, awesome. Cool. Yeah, see you there. I'm uh, at Sam Hu over there as well, if you want to just say hi. Um, good question, though. A lot of people kind of get a bit disheartened because they've... It's like, you know when you learn algebra at school and you're like, well, this is good, but I can't eat it or like I can't drive it somewhere. Like It just doesn't have this immediate usefulness. Multiple non-overriding abstract methods found in interface. Oh, that's annoying. Now I see why they've done it the way they've done it. Uh, yeah, I was like, why are they using the old school way of doing that? Why aren't they using lambdas? But I can see now why that is. So I'm just going to go ahead and copy that verbatim. Pairs.get. Oh, my mouth. Sorry, my mouth is really dry. I'm just going to get a drink. I'll be back in like two seconds. Man, can you hear my PC in the background? It really sounds upset. Uh, <clears throat> I think you can put the type before lambda parameters and it should recognize the overload. Uh, okay, I'll... I have this feeling it won't work, but I will certainly give it a try. Files.walk, file tree, paths. Paths. Um, then you say, what well, path do basic file attributes? Matters. Cannot infer functional type, functional interface type. Different error, but I, th I feel like it's saying the same thing. And I bet it's because, yeah, a bunch of these have the same yeah the same thing does it look for a returned value believe it or not uh, right now let me verify this before I say something incorrect but public void foo path s public string foo path s Yeah, so the return type is not part of the method signature. Did you know that? How strange is that? For reasons totally unbeknownst to me, the method signature does not include the return type. And I really... I don't know why. That, it just makes no sense to me. Any ideas? Ooh, oh, oh, hold on, hold on. Today is the day. Let me just quickly show you what just appeared in my inbox. Uh, how can I do this without giving away my entire inbox to you? Um, damn. Is, any, is anything in here? Damn, okay, so I, I can't can't quite show you because it's in my inbox and I don't fully know. Can I pop that out? I can pop that out. Awesome. Uh, none of that looks too... Let me just get rid of 
Can I? Okay, never mind. Uh, -da! Today is the day. Oh, it feels good. I did realise actually it shows you my awful, embarrassing email address at the top of that, but I made it when I was 13, so please don't judge me. Uh, yeah, woo, congrats. Cheers, Emma. Um, but you had an incorrect overload there, that's why it failed. Uh, can have different lambdas of different return types. I'm not quite sure what you mean. Like, how can I... So, is, are you telling me there's a way that I can write this such that it compiles and works? Because I'm not quite seeing it. Yeah, I don't... I don't think there is a way of doing this. Oh, I, I still think... Return file visit result dot continue? I, yeah, I don't think that makes a huge difference. Because the return type's not part of the signature. For, for reasons that really baffle me. I don't understand why. Yeah, it sucks. It really sucks. Um, I feel like... No, I was going to say I feel like this isn't a particularly well thought through API, but it probably is. I'm probably, I'm probably being unduly unfair about it. Okay, <clears throat> I was doing this. So I wanted to do do.register with my watcher, then entry create, entry delete, and entry modify. And then return and continue. So that's going to register all the directories. And I can get rid of these two now. And then I can loop to look for events. So if I... One thing I'm going to want to do is register new directories with the watcher. So if files dot is directory. Uh, I'm actually going to want path. I think file name is not the world's best name for a path. Uh, did that uh, link option? Oh, symlink, stuff like that, never mind. Uh, so I'll say if directory path path dot register entry create entry delete and entry modify. Uh, Huntex says, I think it's not part of the signature because stuff like method blah uh, is valid even if it returns a string or if it returns void. Let me just process that fully. Why would the return type being part of the signature make a difference there? Are you saying because it would be ambiguous? I can kind of see where you're coming from, I think. Yeah, okay, so you're saying in those cases, in the cases where it's like string something equals method call, or just the method call without that, it would be ambiguous if the return type was part of the signature? I think like, that moves the problem, because currently you, you have that problem, but you have it in a different place. You have it in like when you try and define two methods of the same type but with different return values, you get this ambiguity thing. I don't feel like... I can understand that, that that is a side effect of why that is, but... I don't think that convinces me to make the return type not a part of the method signature. I still think it's a, it would be a good thing to have. This is not something I've thought through in huge detail, but it's something I've stumbled in the past. Um, all right, so the, now we have now we're registering new directories and stuff like that. I will. I should now get a whole bunch of these. So if I run, and let's say I delete a line, 
Ooh, wow, a whole bunch of things. Oh, okay. So it looks like IntelliJ is doing a whole bunch of stuff behind the scenes. Or is this... Uh, what have I got? The full path? Oh, what's the EV? So that's useful. So I can get rid of that. So path to absolute path. Let me kill that off and run again. Hey, for he is back. What up? All right, so now we've got full pass. We can see a little bit better what's going on. Huh? The main.java isn't... That's not the path. I've also just noticed that that's wrong. <laughs> uh, I need to redo these modules. <laughs> Hold on. Uh, uk.co.samhu.sync. Put these in there. Refactor. Refactor. Then delete this. Alright. So. Stop. Oh, it already stopped. Oh, it crashed, didn't it? No, I don't know. Um, yeah, so main.java is not actually at that file path. Yeah, new package versus new folder thing. And always, yeah, it's, I'm, it's not the first time I've done that. I committed some code in work that made that mistake, and it, I felt really embarrassed. Um, <laughs> Fiat is saying, I looked at how CockroachDB does its distribution, and it's Raft, like you told me about. Yeah, Raft is awesome. Raft is absolutely great. Uh, I... I'm going to give you all a link that I think is brilliant. Uh, secret, whoops, raft, secret lives of data. If you have any interest whatsoever in distributed consensus algorithms, or even if you don't, this thing is great and you should watch it. I'll even forgive you if you watch it now, instead of watching my stream. So where was I? Yeah, so I don't fully understand why it thinks main.java is there, because it should be in a bunch of subdirectories. Uh, I'm just going to real quick open up ah, my File Explorer and uh, where's my code? There it is. Just quickly see. Yeah, there's no there's no main.java there. That's a weird absolute path. Uh, let me break there and see what I can see. Uh, that's the underscore JB temp, whatever. Okay, main.java. Relative. Um, so, this is the path to absolute path. Why? That's not. I couldn't read that, right? If I did files read. all lines do I get anything yeah no such file that makes no sense does two absolute paths not do the, the thing I would expect it to what if I did files don't read all lines on just the naked path no such file it makes no sense to me oh this is an entry delete Which is some weird shit. Are you saying that this that I'm doing right now is some weird shit? Or are you saying that Raft is some weird shit? Okay, so that's an, an entry create, delete, create, modify. 
No, this error. Yeah, I don't really fully get what's happening here. So this is a modify. Files dot exists path. The fuck are you talking about? I don't understand. Don't understand. I'm, oh, I'm wondering if this is some freaky IntelliJ shit. Path sync. Does this exist? File start exists. This doesn't exist either. What the fuck? This. 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 This is. <laughs> Help! I don't know what's happening. What if I. Right, what happens in here? Okay, so we have Right, that looks pretty legit. So if I say files exists, this should be true. Okay. Okay. Uh, moving on, I get to the dot idea folder. Source, source main, source main Java, UK, co, Sam, who, sync, so on and so forth, resources, tests, target, all that goodness. But then as soon as I modify this, oh, if I, it's the wrong thing. What if I were to say to absolute path? What then? <laughs> then what? Ooh, whoops. Ah. Okay. That's still wrong. That's still very much wrong. Am I holding this wrong? <laughs> this is what we're going to be stuck on the entire stream. I really hope not. I didn't want to be. I'm assuming that never actually fires because the paths don't exist. Uh, let me just quickly Google for the answer. Java watch service path. Incorrectly resolved absolute path. This sounds pretty, pretty legit. Kind of the path that is a relatively relative path between the directory registered with the watch service and the entry that was created, modified, or deleted. <clears throat> okay. Watch directory resolve created file. Oh. Oh. It's making more sense to me now why they created a map for those keys. Let me see if they do. Yeah. Okay. Why did they get... Yeah. Alright. Right. Okay. That is hella confusing. Wouldn't you agree? Don't you live it when methods don't do what you expect them to. Yeah, that... I... I... Let me just go ahead and copy all of this code. <laughs> uh, let's just stop fucking around here and say... Watch dear. But at least we learned something, you know. Uh, let's just be cheeky and return. I'll get rid of that. And then format the code, save the code. So we want to change this slightly. So I'm going to get rid of usage because I don't care. I'm going to get rid of main because I don't care. 
I'm gonna get rid of that because I don't care. Uh, I would like. I don't care about trace right now. You can always put a logger of some variety in. Uh, I'm gonna say keys put this. Oh, I can't. Can I actually need the key? Ah, we'll leave it like that. Whatever. Whatever. Um, this seems legit enough. We'll make this public. Uh, I dislike boolean, but whatever. Get rid of trace. I want to be able to... So I'm going to call this watch. And it's going to take some consumer yeah so I will say it will take a consumer of watch event path call it consumer <laughs> uh, I will just propagate exceptions for now. I think it's quite legit for this to throw an IO exception. What am I doing? Throws IO exception. Uh, how the irony, what do you mean? Oh, we'll fix this again. It's not the 90s, man. Interrupted exception. Yeah, I think that's quite legit to just return there. Uh, I think. That should never happen, right? I'm just. Just gonna. Take that away. Um, Ironic, it should save others from reading long exception handling, but couldn't save itself from being unreadable. The typo unreadable. I didn't see it. Good eyes. Good eyes. Uh, I don't really want to print the event here. Why? Why be so boast about things. Right, okay, I think that's a pretty serviceable bit of copying from the internet. So instead of doing all of this stuff here, what I will now do is new watch dear paths dot get uh, is it the other way around? I don't know, it's just uh, actually, I don't even, I don't even like the boolean recursive because I, I, I know that I'm always going to want it to be recursive. My God, Oracle, what are you doing? All right, uh, that seems legit. Simplify this a little bit. Cool. Then we get rid of that. We get rid of these. Get rid of that. Get rid of that. And we can say. Kind is event dot 
kind. Let's see how we do now. This should be better because it does all the resolving correctly. So now. Have I... I have, haven't I? I thought you weren't able to concatenate strings in Java, I thought you had to use String Builder. No, you can. Um, so what I've forgotten to do here is actually use the consumer. <laughs> Oh, everything went wrong there. I am so silly. Uh, actually, ooh. let me answer this question first. Um, Simon says, String Builder is useful when you want to concatenate a lot of them. Since string is immutable, it creates a new copy for each concatenation. String Builder avoids that by being mutable. Um, not quite. Close, but no cigar. Uh, so under the hood, if I say string s equals a plus b, the Java compiler will out output bytecode that basically does this. That is precisely equivalent to that. They compile down to pretty much the same thing. So, like, the Java compiler does jiggery pokery magic y stuff. Uh, so, to an extent, Fajita, you are correct. You do need a string builder. It's just that the Java compiler gives you the syntactical sugar of the plus symbol to, to kind of do it automatically. If that answers your question. Let's not bog down to details. You were wrong, damn it! No, in, in a lot of other languages, you'd be correct. Um, does it figure out to use one string builder for loops? That is a good question. I could verify it, but I would need... Do I have a Java compiler? Do I have... My Java p I do, okay, cool. Do I have them? I do! Oh, um, okay. Samo. Public class. Samo. Public. Can you see this? Shall I make this larger? Can I make this? Oh, no. Ah! Oh, God. Oh, God. So I can make it larger. It just freaks out. So public, if I could type that, it would be great. Public static void main string args. Let's say uh, four zero i oh, i less than ten i plus plus um String s equals that plus equals i system dot out dot print line s. So that's kind of what you were thinking, right? Uh, yeah, very very addict functions are a thing in Java. Although again, there's just some more magic that essentially means they boil down to arrays under the hood. Okay, so let's Java samo dot Java. Then uh, decompile it. Unknown dash dash for both. Is it just dash for both? It is. So let's see what we get here. Uh, so we create a new string builder. Uh, only create one of them. So yeah, it's smart enough to know. In a bunch of other languages, this wouldn't be the case, and it would create a new string in each iteration and copy the previous string. 
So you will have accidentally created a quadratic method, but Java is a little bit more intelligent and it creates a string builder and just depends to it. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, good skill to have, by the way, as a professional Java program, the ability to decompile and read bytecode. And it's surprisingly simple to like go down into the details. Where were we? Yes, here we were. Do I want to give the whole event? I like that it's annotated unlike C++ assembly that I've seen. Uh, I'm going to change your life. Hold on. Um, I should have access to a C compiler here. No! Long shot. No! Oh. There is a compiler flag you can do. So if, let's just pretend I have something, some C file. If you did, so dash S for assembly, I think, let me just verify that. Oh, okay, whatever flag it is to, to, to just go to assembly, not binary. I think it's capital S, let's just say capital S. It's gonna be lowercase s. Um, if you did main.c f verbose asm, you'll get like, nice comments and stuff alongside the assembly. Give it a whirl. It's pretty cool. Uh, there's another one as well, I think. Uh, I think there's, an, there's at least one more flag that does nice things with the assembly to make it easier to understand. Uh, yeah, godbolt.org is dope. Absolutely awesome highly useful for figuring out what the hell is happening under the hood. Uh, right, yeah, so I think what I will do here is I will completely abstract away the idea that we're using the watch service, and I will say public static final class event. Not static, call it final. And in here we will have a private Final, not class, path, path, private, final, will I reuse the event type? Mm, no, no, I will say Great update delete. Auto generate my code. I hate that it puts things up there. Like who wants them up there? They go underneath the constructor, damn it. Cool. Uh, okay, cool. Sorry, catching up on chat. Now, I will say consumer accept. Now it's not going to accept a watch event this time, it's going to accept a just an event of our variety. Uh, new event, uh, and it will take child. I'm just going to give it the kind, and I'll make a constructor that converts between the two. Uh, I mean, okay, uh, event half half kind path. And I will say this not path this path. Then I will switch the 
Can I not switch on this? Uh, Chanku is asking in the programming Discord server, when will you be doing the coding practices stream? I am struggling to remember saying that I would do a coding practices stream. I'm not entirely sure what that means. I'll reply to that in a minute. It's in the live stream channel in ProcDisk. I just saw it like flash up on the right side of my screen. Can I not do a switch with this? What? 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 How is it comparing down here? Equal, equal, entry, create. Okay, right, this is... This API is weirding me out. I don't really understand some of these decisions. But I will say if entry create type equals create entry delete. have to throw an exception here, I think. Throw new illegal exception unknown event type. I don't think that's ever going to get thrown, realistically speaking. Yeah, I. so Samo was saying maybe that should be an enum, uh, or not. It's probably for polymorphism purposes. I would have expected it to be an enum, because it is an enumerable thing. Like it, There is an event type. I, that just screams enumerable to me. I still... Oh, I want to get rid of that. So now that is a little hunky dory and I can go back to here and I can say event dot get path get type. And away we go. And terminate that one and... Oh hey, look at this. It's still wrong. Oh no, it's not wrong. Okay, that is much more like it. I don't know what all these things are. I'm assuming that's IntelliJ doing magical things. Um, so the reason I wanted to do... One of the cool... Something I thought would be really awesome is... Let's say I'm writing code and I use some new... Some, some like library call or API call in the Java API that you've not seen before and you're like, huh, oh, I wonder what that does. Uh, I think it would be nice to have this like constantly updating this is automatically linked to the documentation for the things that I'm using if people like I wouldn't dump it into Twitch chat or anything like that I would it would be somewhere else but Chancraft says hey hey Chancraft how's it going welcome to the stream I haven't seen your name before I'm assuming that you're new here uh, if that's the case uh, I will quickly explain what I'm doing so the idea is at the moment I'm just playing around with Java's um, Oh, Chanku, hey, what's up? Good to see you here. So what did you mean by coding practices stream? I can't remember that conversation. I'm sure I do remember talking to you about different stream types, but what exactly are you talking about there? So what I'm, I'm, I'm trying, I'm just playing around with Java's APIs for watching for directory changes. So if, you, if, if you're like modifying files in a directory, you want to get updates on that in real time. That's kind of what I'm working on here. And I've copied some code from the internet. Um, and it's showing me a bunch of like updates, deletes, yada yada yada. So it actually seems to be working and it's giving me notifications in real time. Um, I've seen some cool overlays for Hearthstone where you hover over a card and it gives you the card description, maybe something like that. That's pretty cool. I'm not sure how that would work, as in hovering over the video. Is that what you mean? That seems pretty advanced. Um, but there's a Java parsing library. Let me quickly get a browser window up. Uh, it's literally called Java Parser. I thought it was really cool. For processing Java code. 
and it gives you some nice APIs for reading in Java and making sense of it, which I thought was is pretty pretty cool to play around with. Um, now, how do I? There we go. I just want the pass. I don't think I want the silver. The, the sil silver. The symbol solver. I don't think I want that yet. Let me just play with this for a little while. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Where did you come from? Dependencies. Chancraft is saying in the stream where I volunteered code for you to review and stuff. Ah, yes. Uh, you sent me a bunch of repos. I did not. So I did actually read through a couple of them. Uh, you you have one in there which is like simulating deer population or something like that. I think I had a look at that. Um, so the main blocker for actually looking into that is that I think I would need to review the code relatively extensively before I stream, so that it's not just people watching me read code, which I think is a very limited value. Um, yeah, here it is. You sent me this one, which is a basic deer population simulator. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I didn't go WTF. Uh, I actually... Okay, so impromptu things I vaguely found out. So we start in main. Uh, this all feels a bit too global. Like, I don't see much use of, like, object orientation or anything like that. So it feels like from the very beginning, like, it's not super Java-y, so this, uh, if I remember, is getting a bunch of stuff from the command line. Okay, no, it's just a, a set of globals. Fair enough. Um, let's go back into main. Then you say, do calculations and file output. Yeah, it's, so it all feels very imperative, is what I'm thinking here. Uh, I didn't feel like I was trying to start a program easily. Yeah, it just felt, I was like... The, the, so the way I think of that is, like I say in my head, and I don't normally say it out loud, but in my head I say it's very two-dimensional, in that your your code is like a slice. This must sound so crazy what I'm talking about here, but because everything's global, and the code itself doesn't deal with much dynamic stuff, and like it's not easy to kind of prod and change, and there's not much encapsulation, it just feels like it's a two-dimensional Thing. Like, I'm, I think I'm just talking bollocks, but it, it, that's how I think about it in my head. Um, at the time, I didn't understand the concept of returning variables instead of using global variables. Yeah, it kind of it does kind of show. Um, so, what would be interesting is to maybe if I go away and kind of like get more of an understanding of this. I think what might be interesting for you. I'm not sure if you want this, but I could. Like, I'm not sure if you know how you would rewrite this at the moment, but if I could understand this and have a like go at how I think it would work or what I think is a reasonable design for what you're trying to do do you think that would be interesting is that something you'd watch and is that something everyone here everyone else would would be interested in doing yeah okay cool um, but yeah it, it's gonna require me to go away and like spend an hour or two actually just like absorbing what it's supposed to be doing coming up with an out like one or two ideas on how to lay it out um, yeah. Certainly a cool idea. Certainly a cool idea. Cool. Um, okay, so we have our Java pasta. Uh, sorry, Chancraft saying, I'd honestly enjoy watching that. If you need any information on the program, what I was trying to do, then feel free to comment. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Yeah, definitely will. Streaming code reviews. Yeah, no, Huntex, this is something I've had in my head for a long time. I am a big fan of code review. I. I have uh, I've developed a slight reputation in work for doing possibly over thorough code reviews. Um, I just really enjoy it. I really I like talking to people about code and like the structure of things and thinking about the future and thinking about like is this going to survive the next rewrite of whatever or like is this sufficiently flexible like all that kind of stuff. I love thinking about it. I'm a big fan of API design at all levels. Like networked REST API and stuff like that, all the way down to like actual system APIs and library APIs and one of my favorite aspects of programming is coming up with a really good API or a good interface. Which is why actually I was looking at this and I was thinking, damn, these are some nice interfaces. 
Like, ah, oh, this is cool. Alright, uh... So this is where we start. So I need that Java pass it up pass. So what I was going to try and do is, for everything that changes, try and figure out the lines that have changed and see if I can figure out what's used on those lines. And then see if I can do a stream of, like, posting documentation to new things that I've just used in real time. Chancraft saying, to be honest, I need code reviews. I have very few people able to review it and stuff. I've just been kind of learning and learning, trying to figure out how to do things personally. So yeah, I feel free to review almost any of my programs and stuff. I could uh, really use it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, it's not something I've done yet. It's just something I've wanted to do for quite some time. It's tricky, though. People usually want reviews on pieces of software that are huge. And it's tough to have, like, it's tough to find. It's tough to prioritize that. I'm trying to avoid the phrase, I don't have time, or like, I can't find the time, because it's not necessarily true, it's just, I'm prioritizing things, I'm prioritizing all of my time on other things, uh, so that when someone hands me out this 10,000 line piece of software they've written, and they're like, oh, can you give me a code review? I'm like, honestly, no, like, I just, I just don't have that, that block of time I'd need to review it, but something like this is quite self-contained and small. Any advice on finding people to have them review your code if you aren't working or aren't surrounded with people that don't have a better idea on your work? Funny you should ask, because I know of a programming Discord server that contains a, a channel called Collaborations and Reviews, where you can ask people to review your code, and at least 10% of the time, somebody will agree. <laughs> the, the Collaboration and Review channel that we have in our Discord server is... A lot of people asking for reviews, not many people giving reviews, and I think it's partly because of what I mentioned there. Uh, not a lot of the stuff is standalone. I might actually write a small guide on asking for code reviews, because asking to review like an entire GitHub project is so daunting to the reviewer that it's just never going to happen. If you just like l like limit it to a small, relatively isolated subset, then it's much easier for the reviewer, and you're much more likely to get a review. So I might actually do something like that, like write a guide on how to ask for reviews. But other than that, any advice? Uh, not really. Like it really helps if you have if you're doing it at work, obviously, because then people have to review it. Hopefully, if you're working in that kind of organization. Um, yeah. Not good news there. I'm afraid. I don't really know. I don't really know. So I was doing this. Uh, so I don't want to do that. I just want to do files. Files dot read all bytes from event dot get path byte tray content. Oh, and I can't throw an exception because if I can. This is like the most tedious thing about lambdas. Not lambdas, but the various functional interfaces. They don't throw exceptions. I must run into this problem like daily now. It really frustrates me every time. So does Java parser dot parse only take a string or oh it can take a path? Oh, even better. Even better. Oh it's a uh, event that get path. And it can throw a load of things. So I now instead need to put this in here. And then I get a compilation unit back. Trancraft asking what editor are you using? This is IntelliJ with the material theme plugin. Love it. I think it looks so much nicer with this plugin. So what do I actually get on the compilation unit? Actually, first of all, what I need to do is I need to say if event get type not equal type dot update, then we return. I don't care about creates and deletes just for the time being. Um, actually, we only really don't care about deletes. 
then if event dot get path dot ends with if it doesn't end with dot java we also don't care about it then we compile it and in this compilation unit what do we have get classes get a whole bunch of stuff you know what I'm gonna instead of printing things out here I'm just gonna throw a breakpoint there and see what we get in these compilation units. Ooh, uh, so now if I save this. Nope. Ready? What if I put the right point there instead? Um. Okay, so that one doesn't end with dot java. Think main. Okay, so this one should be. Oh, it's a delete. So we skip it. Whatever. Uh... Okay, so this one's a create. That step over, step to the next line, yeah. So, why does it not end with event dot get path ends with dot Java? Really? Why not? What is what is happening this evening? What have I done wrong? <laughs> What? What? Why? How the fuck can they differ? In s oh. What does this do? What does this purport to give me? Test if this path ends with a... Ends with a path constructed by converting the given path string in exactly the manner specified by ends with path method on using ends with foo slash bar okay <sighs> so I think it's looking at the last path segment and asserting that it's equal to so if I did event dot get path dot ends with main dot java that's true fuck off like ugh. fine fine Jesus. Okay. It's good. We're fine. It's chill. No big deal. <laughs> no big deal. I want to break that. I want to break here. Let's go. I was promised machines yelling at adults earlier. I may get an adult yelling at machines soon. Like, just it just felt like the the watch service API feels unintuitive in a bunch of places, and then this path API feels quite unintuitive. Like, if you're gonna if you're gonna take a string, it just feels like you're asking for, you're asking to shoot yourself in the foot if you're expecting that to be a, what is essentially a path. Uh, that that feels like an extraneous method to me. Oh, now what? Now what? Huh? Why? What? Nothing? Oh, oh. oh God, I tell you. It's the heat. It is It is the heat doing this. I think I press play rather than debug. Which obviously isn't going to debug anything. There we go. Ooh! It's past the Java code. That's quite exciting. It might have been renamed to ends with segment, and it yeah something like that. Just just 
So now I have this compilation unit. What do I get with it? So, what is a meta model? Imports, types. Can I get methods? Get, nope, get functions, nope, get. Um, annotated declarations, nope. Child nodes. Um, class by name, comments, you know my name. None of these seem like get methods. Find all field declaration dot class. Okay. Method? So if I did find all method declaration uh, method body method reference exp mm. okay I think I need to look up for more docs here so if I so analyzing oh where's the full doc like more comprehensive docs for this library to be honest with you. I, okay, fine. They're, they're, they're writing a book, but I don't really want to write a, I, don't, I don't, don't really want to read a book at this point. I want just to see what I have available to me in terms of Yeah, it has one method declaration. Um has a body. Wow. That is a lot of things that it implements. Node with, node with, node with, node with body? Node. Optional block statement. Method declaration. Hmm. Okay, if I get... What do I have here? Get body. It's a block statement. Oh, it's an optional block statement. Okay. So then I can say get statements. Okay. Uh, and then within statements, what do I have? Get. Hmm. The fault in our streams, welcome back. I remember you from when you followed and I commented on the John Green reference because I love John Green. Uh, what do you mean by fiddling with Java's file system? So Java uh, file system watch service specifically. So Java has an API for like watching a directory for changes. And what I'm kind of trying to do like, in abstract, what I'm trying to do is look for changes in Java files and create like a stream of like helpful documentation. Like if you if you if you save a file and it's using like math dot abs or something like that for like absolute, it will output like the documentation for that. Just as a it's just like a, a random exercise to see how the API use uh, the API works. Chancraft is now for uh is now following. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, falling over my words here. Yeah, it's just it's just an exercise to get to to know some new APIs. I'm also looking at a new library I haven't used before called Java Parser um, for like doing wacky stuff with Java source code. Uh, yeah, basically just, you're just using set of classes and libs to learn some Java stuff. I'm just yeah, I'm just kind of chilling, learning some new libraries, seeing what can be done. I imagine Apache NiFi uses this. Let's have a look at what that is. Apache NiFi. 
Oh, I've, I've seen this before. Somebody was talking about this in the programming discussion Discord server. I can't remember who it was. Um, maybe? I imagine they maybe use it or something similar to it. What am I clicking on? There we go. Uh, so, it, what is in a statement? Data range. Okay, so this is something that I'm interested in. Yeah, okay, cool. So it does that tell you the does actually tell you what line things are on, which is useful. Um, <clears throat> what is a meta model? So this is an expression statement. Okay, nothing on here looks super useful. I want to see if the statement contains like other method calls or classes. Um, child nodes. Um, that's not really quite what I'm looking for. I always find like AST parsing to be very confusing. Uh, so this is an expression statement, isn't it? Yeah. So what do I have in get expression? What does this give me? Method call expression. Uh, this isn't helping me. Can I now say like as? method call expression. I can. Okay, this is getting confusing. <laughs> Ooh, name. Okay, so the method is called watch. This is the stuff I was looking for. Can I say... What's the scope? Okay. I want, does it give me the... the class? It gives me the arguments, which is the lambda. A lambda expression. Uh, I want to see if it can get the class name. Get, get class. It's not, it's not going to be what I think it is. It's going to be the actual class. Type arguments? Okay, doesn't have any. Let's just, let's just rewind slightly here because we've gotten a bit out of hand. We're going to have to get body. So we have, yeah, statements. And there. So there's only one statement, which is a little bit... It does have child nodes, though. Child nodes is a method. Cool. Then this will have child nodes. Object creation. Simple name. Oh, the object creation expression is probably going to have, yeah. Type. Nice. Sam says, work day tomorrow. Have fun, Sam. It's actually, it's a work day f for me as well, so I should probably go. Um, this looks like a massive rabbit hole, but it looks like good fun, regardless. Um, so yeah, I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, thank you for everyone for joining. Uh, people that joined later in the stream. Earlier in the stream, I got an email to apply for Twitch affiliation, which I'm really happy about. So I will apply for that and report back on its status at some point. Not sure when the next stream will be, but probably at some point during the week. I, I always announce my streams on the Programming Discussions Discord server, which if you're interested, the invite is going to be in chat. Boom. Um, we have a live streams channel in there, as well as like a bunch of, a bunch of other channels where people just hang out and talk about code. And like if you're trying to learn something, you get stuck, you can ask questions and stuff like that. Um, yeah, Chancraft, I will try and read your code in more depth and learn what it's doing. And then I'll do a stream where I kind of try and rewrite it in a way that I think is quite nice and talk about why I'm doing it. Cool. So, yeah, have a good day, evening, morning, wherever you are. Peace and all that.
Good night.